Good morning, and welcome to worship here at Trinity. We're so glad that you are here to worship with us today. Uh, if, you're our, if you're a guest with us today, I'd like to call your attention to the pew rack in front of you. You'll find there a guest information card, and we'd love it if uh, at some point during the service you took a minute to fill that out and give us your name and a way that you would like us to contact you, however you would prefer that to happen. We'd love to be able to drop you a line and say, hey, glad you were here, and answer any questions you might have about the church, our ministries, our outreach, anything you you might want to know about. So please just fill that out and then later in the service when the offering plates get passed through just drop it in the offering plate and we'll we would love to get in contact with you. Uh, I would now like to draw your attention, attention to a few announcements in your bulletin. I invite you to look at those as the service goes on but I want to highlight a few of them. Uh, one that happened today already uh, in early worship, Ronnie Sams joined our church. So if you see him, uh, he's someone who's been here for a while and been involved, but if you see him, extend a special welcome to him as a new member of our church family. Uh, then a few announcements for what's happening tonight. At 4.30, we will have a deacon's meeting followed by celebration worship at 6, but it's a special celebration worship in that it is a deacon ordination service. We will ordain two new deacons and we will take communion together. That service, normally celebration is in the youth room, but tonight's service will be in here at 6 o'clock and we hope that, um, that y'all can make it out for that. Also, a uh, music ministry announcement. I'm glad this worked out well. Uh, if you have any interest in kind of testing the choir waters, or if you just really would like to sing the Christmas music that we do every year, we start those rehearsals September 9th. And if you want to come and just do that, that's wonderful. We invite you to come and just sing Christmas music if that's what you'd like to do. We will rehearse that music for the first 45 minutes of choir so you can come. We work on that and then you're welcome to leave. You're also welcome to stay. But you are uh, welcome to leave at that point as we work on the music for the Sundays in between now and Advent. So that starts September 9th in here at 7 o'clock. And anyone and everyone is welcome. You do not have to read music. That's probably, as a music minister, the number one hang-up I hear from people, I can't read music. It doesn't matter. Come, we will work the parts. If you want to sing, then you that's all you need to do. That's the only requirement you have to have. At this time, I invite you to stand and greet each other by passing the peace of Christ. We're so glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. Today we continue our series uh, engaging the great stories of the Bible, and today we engage the story of Joseph. Welcome to worship. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time that we've come together to worship you. We thank you for the blessings that we have from our church, from our community, and from our country. We ask now that you would be with us during this time of worship, that you would allow your spirit to be among us and allow all that we do and say be pleasing to you. We ask that you allow our minds and our hearts to be open to the message and the music today and that we will leave reinvigorated and recharged to serve you in the weeks to come. And we ask all this in your name, in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Let us now sing together our hymn of invocation, hymn number six, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Please stand as we sing together. Please be seated. It is in Psalm 4610 that we receive our instruction, be still and know that I am God. At this time I invite you to join me in a moment of quiet rest before our God. Let's pray. God who spoke the world into being, we ask that you recreate us again. To God who spoke sight to the blind, we ask that you help us to see. To God who spoke peace to the waves, we ask that you calm and comfort us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Good morning. Today's scripture lesson is from Genesis 37, 1 through 11. Joseph's dream. Now Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob. Joseph, when 17 years of age, was tending the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a multicolored coat. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all the other brothers and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Then Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers they hated him even more. He said to them, Please listen to this dream which I have had. For behold, we are binding sheaves of grain in the fields. So when suddenly my sheaf rose up and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to it. Then his brother said to him, Are you actually going to reign over us? Or are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Now he had still another dream, and related it to his brothers, and said, Lo, I have had still another dream, and behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. He, re he related it to his father and to his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. At this time, our pre-K and our kindergartners are invited to exit for children's worship as we sing together our song of faith in the secret. Please stand as we sing together. Yeah. 
Please be seated. <clears throat> the health of a minister impacts the ministry of the church because research has shown that one key element of ministerial health is shared learning and support with peers. CBF offers peer learning groups as a way to establish a small community of support. Ministers across the fellowship gather regularly with their peer learning group to worship, learn, share, grow, and fellowship. Groups covenant together to protect this time in their calendars as they intentionally plan their gatherings to best address their needs. They meet over lunch for a retreat or via technology. They read books, share stories, plan sermons, and dialogue around difficult topics. These small groups join together with others doing the same type of ministry, experiencing the same life stage, or because they live within driving distance of each other. Peer learning groups are life-giving to the minister, to their congregations, and to their families. Pray that peer learning groups will continue to be a safe place where ministers can be vulnerable, as well as find support and renewal during their times together. Pray for the congregations represented in these groups. Pray for wisdom as the conveners lead the groups so that all can learn best practices for their ministries. Please pray with me silently. Amen.
Good morning. It's good to see you here today as we come together to worship. One of the most remarkable stories ever told is in the last 14 chapters of the first book of our Bible, in the book of Genesis. It concludes with the very end of that book. It is the story of Joseph, the dreamer. We're going to talk about his story today. It is particularly the story of a larger family, the story of Jacob. Jacob was one of the three great patriarchs of Israel. His grandfather was Abraham, his father was Isaac, and this is Jacob. At one point, Jacob wrestles with God in a dreamlike experience and later gets his name changed to Israel, one who strives with God. Jacob, Israel, will have 12 sons. And each of these 12 sons will be the founders of the great 12 tribes that make up the nation of Israel. When we catch up to them in this part of Genesis, we will find that the dream of Abraham, his grandfather, has come true. His family is settled in the land of Canaan, the promised land that Abraham and Sarah saw and dreamt and hoped for for so many years. When I was younger, and I think I've mentioned this to you before, I learned that when you craft sermons, there are different ways to do that. And one of the ways is to picture a grandfather clock, sort of the pendulum swinging, the tick and the tock. Hopefully there's a tick to the sermon that gets your attention and then there's this flow, the swing of the pendulum. Hopefully it's going somewhere and there's finally a talk to the sermon. And I think great stories are like that too. In this story, the tick is the day that Joseph is born and the pendulum swings to the story of his family a family's life that is weaved into the story of God, how God works in the lives of families who struggle, who are real, who have great days and have very difficult, hard days. And the talk is the end of the story, which I would say is a little bit after the death of Joseph. It's a great story of our faith. Now, I'm in this series of sermons talking about these great stories from the Bible in order for us to engage these stories and know them better. They are part of the foundation of what we believe as followers of God. In, a, in an earlier time, we could come maybe to a Baptist church and the preacher could stand up and say, how many of you know this story? How many of you have ever heard of Joseph in the Old Testament? And almost everyone would probably have raised their hands and said, I know about Joseph, at least some of the details. I know he had a coat of many colors. Someone would say, well, I know he went down to Egypt and became a great person. So we knew some of the details. We can't always take that for granted anymore. So for some of you as you hear these stories, you're going to have your memories refreshed as you re-encounter the story that you've heard maybe since you were in vacation Bible school and Sunday school as a child in church. For others of you, it may be the first time that you know this story. And it was hard for me to pick ten. I'm doing five from the Old Testament, five from the New uh, what story would you pick? It's hard to pick those stories. So these are ten I consider great stories of our faith. And today we will listen to the story of Joseph the Dreamer. Now before we get to chapter 37 that uh, Glenn read for us this morning, Joseph is mentioned two other times previous to this chapter. First is the day that he's born. We get the report that Joseph is born and it says it this way. The firstborn son of Jacob's favorite wife was born. Now immediately a red flag should go up. In fact any time in life you hear someone say the firstborn child of his favorite wife right there you, you should have alarm bells going off because this is going to be a very difficult family situation. Now some of you know there's been a website breach and names published lately and, and, and I was interested to see in that a story of people's names being revealed. There was a legislator in the Knesset of Israel, a Bedouin, and his name was revealed. And so the reporters came down on him and said, hey, have you been on this website? And he says, no. I said, I have two wives already. Why would I need to go and, you know, and go to the website? So there may be some exceptions. Joseph's story is that his daddy Jacob had four wives, and of those four, there are 12 boys, 12 sons who were born. They all live in the same household. Now, a red flag should go up right there, right? Because there's a lot going on. And then we are told that, that he has this one child, Joseph, who is his favorite from his favorite wife of those four. Now, her name is Rachel. Rachel of beautiful eyes and a beautiful body. He worked for her daddy seven years. Her daddy's name is Laban. Worked seven years of hard labor in order to have the right for her daddy to say, you can marry Rachel. And he does, and they're extremely happy, but she cannot have children. At least that's what they think. 
but they're okay. And then one day, this baby comes, baby Joseph, and then another baby, baby Benjamin. So these become the favorite children of the favorite wife of Jacob, the great patriarch Israel. That's the first time we hear about Joseph. The second time we hear about Joseph is when his daddy Jacob says, it's time for us to go to my old home place. It has been a long time since Jacob has been home, and he's on the way. And the last time he was there, he and his brother had such an argument, it was not a good party. And so his brother Esau said, if my conniving brother ever comes home again, I'm going to kill him dead. So you put word out. So he goes back home, and Jacob decides he now has a large family, a lot of servants, animals, flocks, caravan of people. And he's on his way home, and he decides, my brother Esau may still be breathing death threats toward me, and who knows what he'll do. He has an army of farmhands. So he lines up his family in order of least favorite to most favorite. Can you imagine? So the front of the line are the least favorite, and in the back of the line are the most favorite. And the thinking is, if, if there is an attack, the, the front of the line will take the brunt of it, but the folks in the back of the line could possibly escape. My favorite wife, Rachel, and the little boy, Joseph. So there you go. It's a great story, right? And it's a wonderful mix for a happy, harmonious family life, right? <laughs> so the seeds of jealousy have been planted, and then there are these ten other brothers, and every day they go out and work in the big farm, the big land that they have, and they work very hard. Now Benjamin is just a baby. He's young. He's too small to go work, so he's excused. Joseph goes out to the fields with the other brothers, but he doesn't work either. And he just sits there and he watches, and he watches what they do, and he reports back to his daddy. Have you ever had a sibling like that? Their chores to be done, and, and your sibling says, you know, I have this headache that's, that's coming on, and my stomach's been bothering me for a while. I think I just won't be able to do anything today. And there you are grinding your teeth at your brother or your sister while you're working and doing the chores. Well, it didn't work too well then. And the part of the process was that Daddy said, I want you, Joseph, to go and observe the work. So not only is he not working, he's observing the other brothers, and he comes back and reports to his Daddy. You know, well, so-and-so, Isaacar was not working much today. He was sort of laid off a little bit. He just slept under the tree or something. And, Daddy, I think you need to probably do something about that. How do you think that would work in your family if you put one of your kids over the other kids? Well, it didn't work very well back then either. And so they're very jealous. There's all this jealousy because not only is he the favorite son of their dad, he's also a tattleteller. And then when he appears for work, he wears this real fancy coat. And the Hebrew is uncertain. Some translations say it's a coat of many colors. Some say it is a coat with long sleeves, long coat. Either way, it wasn't a working coat. It's an overseer's coat. So he wears that coat out there, and it's not a coat you'd wear at a construction site to work in. We wouldn't take that kind of coat to the DR on a mission trip. It's not the coat you wear out to work on the farm to load hay. It's not. It's not a working coat, but he wears it. And he goes out there, and he struts out to the work site, and they're having a hard time with it. They're snarling and grinding their teeth, and they're upset, and this is the younger brother. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. The younger brother's not supposed to lord it over the older brothers. So they don't like it. It's not good. It's not good. And then he comes home and he tells Daddy, well, some of the boys worked hard today, but here are the ones that didn't, and you need to probably talk to them, Dad. So it's not good. It's not healthy for the family. And then he, has, he goes to dreaming. He starts having these dreams. And he struts out there, watching him work, wearing his nice coat, and he says, guys, come here, I've got something to tell you. I had this dream last night, and it's a little strange, but I dreamt that there were these 12 sheaves of grain all tied up, stacked up, one for each of us. But my sheaf of grain stood erect and tall in the center, and you all got around me and bowed down to me. And, of course, the brothers loved that dream. It didn't go over too well. And the Bible says that they hated him for his dreams. And then he had another dream, and he told everybody. And his dad, Jacob, was so disturbed, he rebuked him for this dream. Not only were the sheaves of grain bowing down to him, but the sun and the moon were bowing down, and there were 11 stars. How many brothers are left? There's 11 brothers. The 11 stars, representing each of his brothers, are all bowing down to Joseph. It's not good. So when he walks out in the field, strutting out there to watch them, wearing his fancy coat, they all grind their teeth and they say, here comes the dreamer. I hate him. I hate that boy. And their jealousy, left unchecked, grew to become deep-seated hatred for their brother. 
So much so that some of the brothers in that group decided it would be better if Joseph just wasn't here at all. Some even wanted to murder their brother. And one day, an opportunity comes. Dad calls Joseph in and he says, Now the boys are working. They're about 50 miles away. And I'd like for you to go look in on the work and come back and report. Let me know how things are going. So Joseph, in his immaturity and in his arrogance, puts on his fancy coat and goes out to the work site. And as soon as they see him under that hot sun and all the work they're doing, some of them have had enough and they're ready to lay hands on him, beat him up, and maybe just kill him right there on the spot. But there is an older brother named Reuben who says, I have a plan. There's a big pit over here, as you all know. Let's just apprehend this guy, throw him in the pit, and let him rot for a while. And so they all agree. Now Reuben's plan was to sneak back at night with a rope and let little boy Joseph out of the pit. But another plan is hatched right there on the spot, on the spur of the moment, by Judah, who says, well, look there. There's a caravan coming down from the north. It's a slave caravan, slave traders, on the way from the north down into the great nation of Egypt. And he says, boys, come here. What if we get him out of the pit, get him out of our lives? Let's sell him to these people and we'll even have a little jingle in our pocket when we do it. And that's exactly what they do. And so what to tell daddy? Joseph doesn't come home. Well, they take his coat and they rip it and they tear it and they rub it against rocks and then they spill some, they douse it with some blood from a slain animal and they take it to the daddy and say, we never saw Joseph, but we found this coat. What could it mean, daddy? And the Bible says that Jacob went into a deep grief, deep mourning, and he begins to cling to Benjamin, his youngest son. And he says, Benjamin, you're not ever going to go out in the fields. You're going to stay around the house where I can always see you. The deep grief. And the story's over, right? The story's done. That's what they thought, because now they just settled in. There's only 11 of us. That's the way it is. Daddy will grieve, but at least Benjamin will be with him, and he will get through this. There's 11 of us. The story's over. Life will go on. But the story is not over, is it? Joseph is with those slave traders, and he heads down to Egypt, and on the slave block, he is sold to a high-ranking army official named Potiphar in the Egyptian army. And Potiphar has an eye for people. He can look at you and he can size you up and tell us a lot about who you are just by the way you walk and talk. And he notices that Joseph is a fine person. He notices that he has certain gifts. Gifts for organization, for administration. And he's good with numbers. So very soon, Potiphar sets Joseph as the head of his household. I want you to run my state. And he does. You know, so you're thinking of the story. What a, it's a terrible turn, what happened to Joseph with his family and his brothers, but he's landed on his feet. He's in a great place now. He's in Egypt. He's running one of the great households of Egypt. He's running the estate. Well, things worked out for that boy, didn't they? But the pendulum is still swinging in his story. Potiphar has a wife. And the wife is a person who's used to getting her way. And she has a wandering eye. And she looks at Joseph and she sizes him up too. And she says, you know, not only is he smart, but he's good looking. I like him. And so she finds ways for Joseph to be alone with her, maybe in her own chambers. And she says to Joseph, you know, Potiphar, my husband, he's off doing army stuff all the time. He's away a lot. And, and I'm lonely and you're good looking. And so I wonder if we could just get together. Nobody would have to know. We wouldn't tell anybody. It'd be completely secret, just between you and me. I'd send all the servants away. Nobody would know but us. But she's dealing with a Joseph who's maturing now in the story. He's developing a moral compass. He's becoming a person who doesn't just think about himself. He thinks more about what things mean and why he is. And so he says to Potiphar's wife, I can't do this. You know, young people can be great, even young ministers, if we give them time. And we're patient with them. And he says to the wife, I can't do this. Because I'd know. And God would know. I can't do this. But she continues to pursue him. And one day is so aggressive 
that in her inner chambers, she wrestles with him. He escapes, but she grabs his outer cloak and pulls it off of him. He runs out half naked, and she screams, bloody murder. And then Potiphar comes home. Now, in any story you've ever heard, the master of the house, if they find out that one of the slaves is messing around with a mistress, well, it's not good. And so the penalty is very harsh. It could be death. But Potiphar, who has an eye for people, interestingly enough, looks at Joseph and decides that the sentence is just get him out of here. Just remove him from this situation. And he is. He's gone. He ends up in jail, in prison. You know, up one day, down the next. That's the way our lives are too. Some days are great and they're wonderful. And other days, we don't know how we're going to get through them. There's days of great joy and days of grief. They're fair. They're unfair. That's the way the pendulum swing of real life works. And he goes to this prison. And the prison officials notice that he's pretty intelligent. And they begin to give him more and more responsibility until he becomes something of a trustee in the prison where other, other prisoners are under his, his work control. And he leads them. And one day, two of the prisoners come to him. These two guys come to him and said, We hear you're a dreamer. And you know a lot about dreams. And we've had these strange dreams. And we just can't get them out of our heads. And we can't figure out what these dreams are about. And since you're a dreamer and you know a lot about dreams, we wonder if you can help us. Well, one of them was a butler, a former butler, of the great king of Egypt, Pharaoh. He was the guy who would bring the cup of wine and drink to the king. He was very close to the ear of the king, and he was in prison. The other guy was the baker, the baker who produced the food for the king. And they're both in prison, and they have these dreams. And they start telling their dreams. Now, the order that they tell it is very, very important. The butler tells his dream first, and it works out good. And I think that if it were opposite, the butler probably never would have told his dream because the baker says, here's my dream. I'm walking to see the Pharaoh, and I got three baskets of bread on my head. And there are these birds swarming around, and they're nibbling and taking bites of the bread. Tell me what that dream means. And Jacob, when Joseph says, well, it's not good. It's not good at all. In three days, the king's going to call for you, but he's going to call for your head. He's going to remove your head, and your body's going to hang there, and these birds are going to come, and they're going to nibble at what's left of your body. I know it's gross, but it's in the Bible. It's a dream. And if it was the other way around, the butler went first, the butler was coming second, and then the butler would say, I had a dream, but forget it. I'm not going to, I don't want you to interpret my dream now. But the butler went first. The butler's dream was pretty easy. He saw this vine of grapes, and somebody went in and squeezed the grapes into a cup, and there he is carrying that cup, setting it before the king. And Joseph said, well, it's good. It's good for you. In three days, you too will be called by Pharaoh, and you will go before the king and be restored to your place in the palace. But don't give me credit for this. And you see, he's maturing a lot. I want to give credit to God, because like all our dreams, God knows them. And God knows more about us than we even know about ourselves, including our destinies. So God is not only the giver of dreams and hopes, but also the interpreter of those. He gives God credit. He says just one favor to the butler. When you get restored to the palace, would you remember me? Because as well as I'm doing in prison, I'm in prison. I'd like to get out. So would you remember me to the king? Well, the butler goes in three days, sure enough, is restored to the palace and forgets all about Joseph. I don't know about you, but that's awfully strange to me. The guy that got you out of jail? I think I'd remember that, wouldn't you? I forget a lot of things. I think I'd remember that. But then on reflection, I think, well, maybe sometimes we do forget things that are very, very important. And we shouldn't forget them. Sometimes when we're focusing so much on ourselves and what's happening to us, don't we sometimes forget even those closest to us? Sometimes we forget those around us who are in need and we forget to take care of those needs. Sometimes when things are happening for us, and they're really good things, we sometimes forget the people who help support us so that we're in that place. We forget to say thank you and gratitude to express. Well, the butler goes back, and he's doing fine, and some time passes, and then there's more dreaming going on in the palace. This time, the Pharaoh is having these dreams, and they're odd dreams. He comes and tells his court, well, I had a dream last night, and there were these seven fat grains 
stalks of grain of wheat and there were seven skinny stalks, not much on them. And for some reason the skinny stalks swallowed up the big fat heads of grain. It's a strange dream, but dreams can be strange, can't they? You ever woke up and tried to tell your family about the dreams you've been having? It's a good thing maybe we don't remember a lot of them because they're just so strange and odd. But then he had an even stranger dream. He said, I dreamt one day by the Nile River there were these seven really fat, big, big calves. And there were seven skinny, ribs showing calves. And, and you know, I think they got into a fight. And who's going to win that fight? Well, the seven fat calves are going to win, but not in the dream. In the dream, the seven skinny cows whip the fat cows, and then they eat them. It's pretty gross. It's a strange dream. And nobody in the palace knows what in the world to do with it. And then the butler, who's bringing the cup of wine to the king one day, says, well, you know, there was a guy back in prison. He knew a lot about dreams. Go get him. And so he brings him, and there he stands, Joseph, before the great Pharaoh of Egypt. And he says, well, king, it's, it's a good thing. It's a good thing for Egypt. You're dreaming about seven really great years. The rains will fall. The forest will bloom. The Nile will flow. Crops will grow. Animals will produce. It'll be a great time of abundance, feasting time. But then after that, there'll be seven years. The rains won't come. It'll be a time of famine. The crops won't grow. The animals won't produce. The forest won't bloom. It'll be hard times. And so I would suggest, king, that you put somebody in charge of during the seven good years, just sort of storing up a lot of the stuff so when the recession hits, you'll be ready. You've had a plan of savings, so, so you're ready to budge against whatever it is that comes in those seven real hard years. And Pharaoh says, how about you? You, know, you seem to know a lot. How about you? In fact, I want you to carry out this plan. You can become the second most powerful man in Egypt. You can ride in the second chariot beside me anytime we go out. So I want you to do this job and execute it now. And so he does. And sure enough, there are seven great years in Egypt. The land flows, there's all this stuff, and they store it, and Joseph oversees the collection of it, and the storage of all the food and the supplies. And then these seven hard years hit. Now by this time, Joseph is going by an Egyptian name, and he dresses and looks just like an Egyptian. And when the seven hard years hit, there are people all over the Middle East and North Africa who are starving, and they hear about there's food down in Egypt. So they go to Egypt and they buy food so they could survive. And there's this Egyptian man that's very powerful who is dispensing the food. And you buy it from Pharaoh's storehouses. And, and it's so bad that it finally reaches the land of Canaan and the family of Jacob. And so Jacob one day calls his, brothers, his, his sons together and he says, Boys, we're starving to death here. Nothing's growing. And so I've heard there's food down in Egypt. And I'd like you all to go down to Egypt and buy some food and bring it home. Now, of course, Benjamin's going to stay here. He's not going to go with you. He's going to stay with me, stay by the house. And so sure enough, they go. And they get down there. When they get down there, there's Joseph. But they don't recognize Joseph. He's, he recognizes them. These are his brothers. But Joseph, he was 17 years old the last time they saw him. And he's dressing like an Egyptian, Egyptian name. And they're not expecting him. He's long gone, they think. And so he recognizes them. And Joseph disguises as Egyptian, he asks them all these probing questions. And it's odd to them, but they answer them. Questions about their family and their land. Joseph's trying to find out, is daddy still alive? Yeah, he's alive. Jacob's still alive. And so is our brother. We have another brother who's not here, Benjamin. They're still alive. And Joseph decides to say to them, I think you're spies. And he puts them all in jail. And they're all sitting in the jail cell, and Joseph's in a secret room listening to their conversation. They're all sitting around pointing fingers at each other and saying, you know why we're here, don't you? You know why we're in jail? Why this bad thing happened to us? Because we did something really bad years ago. And they didn't want to talk about it, but they all knew. They knew what they had done. And Reuben speaks up and says, well, I had a plan. If you just followed my plan, we wouldn't be in this place today. I wanted to put him in that pit and I was going to sneak back at night, get a rope and get him out, take him back to daddy. Everybody would be good. We wouldn't be in this situation that we are today. And outside in that room where Joseph's listening, the Bible says he starts crying. This is the first time he actually hears that one of his brothers didn't want to kill him. So the next day he brings them all before him. They still don't recognize him. And he says, here's some food, but just enough for a short period of time because you've told me about this mythical brother that you have, Benjamin. I want to know for sure he exists. So if you want more food, you come back, but you've got to bring Benjamin with you. So they head back with what food they have. And they say to their daddy, we've got to take Benjamin if we want more. And the daddy says, no, that's my youngest boy. 
This is my favorite son from my favorite wife. It's the only one I got left. He's not going, but the family is starving to death. And so he goes. And they get down there, and this Egyptian, Joseph, has a real big banquet for him. And they're all seated by the order of their ages. And they're sitting around eating, they're looking at each other and say, Isn't that funny how we're all seated? Sort of odd, isn't it? The next day, the soldiers come and say, Well, you've got all the food, we packed it for you, it's all in sacks, you just load it your stuff and you can head out. Not knowing that one of them has snuck a little silver cup into one of the sacks of the food. So they head out on their way back to Canaan, back home to Jacob, back home to Daddy. And the soldiers stop them near the border. And they say, you're thieves. you got a thief in your group. And they say, no, we don't. We don't do that. Well, somebody stole a silver cup. No, it's not us. In fact, if we find out who it was, we'd kill them ourselves because we know it wasn't us. None of us did it. But we're going to search your sack. So they search and they find a silver cup. And whose bag was it in? It was in the favorite son, a favorite wife, Benjamin. Little Benjamin's sack. And at that moment, one of the brothers says, oh, no. This will kill daddy. He can't take this again. Not losing another son. So Judah says, I'll take his place. If you want to enslave me, enslave me. But let my brother go. If you want to kill me, kill me. But let my brother go. Did you know? Judah and his family are the ones that God chose to be the direct ancestors of Jesus Christ who one day will step in for you and me to save us all. Well, Joseph at this point has had enough. And there's this great reveal. It is me. It is I, Joseph. And the brothers, what goes through their head is, uh-oh, <laughs> here it comes. Revenge time. But this is God's story. And it is a story of family and forgiveness. Some of the most difficult people in our lives to forgive are the people who are closest to us. Joseph says, I know you meant this for harm, but God intended it for good. And he forgives them because he believes in God. Because he believes that God works in ways that are very mysterious Sometimes we can't see it happening. But that God is working in every pendulum swing that ever has existed in yours and mine. And God's working in Joseph's story too. And because he trusts God, he is able to forgive those who hurt him the most. The talk has almost arrived for our story. And as it comes, we hear very clearly the story of our faith that tells us that God works in the midst of our family life, including church family. And God asks us to do two great things. One is to practice the spiritual discipline of forgiving each other. And Lord knows we all have things that we must forgive. And the second thing, as the pendulum swings in our lives, is to remember to trust God who is with you and with me from the tick all the way to the top. Amen. Hello, I'm Mike Oliver. I'm the senior pastor here at Trinity Baptist Church. I'd like to thank you for joining us for worship through our church website. And also I'd like to invite you to come and visit us. This is a great church. We have friendly people here. We value worship. We value community and global missions and their programs for children all the way to senior adults. I think you'll like our church and I hope you'll come and visit us and see for yourself in person. If you have questions about our church, like to know more, we'd love for you to contact us. There's information on our website. You can call us or email us or come by and one of our staff members will be glad to talk with you. Welcome to Trinity and God bless you and keep you.